All right, hello, this is Jesse Johnson. Uh, it's been a little while since I've actually read from Journey to the Center of the Earth, and we're um, getting near to, I think, a big turning point in the story, so I was excited to get back into it. Um, no big recap this time, I'll just pick right up where I left off with Chapter 28, The Rescue in the Whispering Gallery. When I came to again, my face was wet with tears. How long that state of insensibility had lasted, I cannot say. I had no means now of keeping track of time. Never was there a solitude like the like of this. Never had any living being felt so utterly abandoned. After my fall, I had lost a good deal of blood. I felt covered in it. Ah, uh, how happy I would have been to have died already, for death not still to be gone through. I no longer wanted to think. I chased away every idea, and, overcome by grief, I rolled to the floor of the opposite wall. I was already feeling another fainting fit coming on, and was hoping for complete annihilation, when a loud noise reached me. It was like the distant rumble of continuous thunder, and I could hear its deep sound rolling far away into the remote recesses of the abyss. Where could this noise be coming from? It must be from some phenomenon happening in the great depths in the midst of which I lay helpless. Was it an explosion of gas? Was it the fall of some mighty pillar of the globe? I continued to listen. I wanted to know if the noise would be repeated. A quarter of an hour passed. Silence reigned in this gallery. I couldn't even hear the beating of my heart. Suddenly, my ear, resting by chance against the wall, caught, or seemed to catch, certain vague, indescribable, distant, articulate sounds, like words. I shuddered. My mind is playing tricks on me, I thought. But it wasn't. Listening more carefully, I really did hear a murmuring of voices. My weakness prevented me from understanding what the voices were saying, but it was language, I was sure of it. For a moment, I was afraid the words might be my own, carried back to me by an echo. Perhaps I had been crying out without being aware of it. I closed my lips firmly and laid my ear against the wall again. Yes, really, someone is speaking. Those are words. From a few feet, even a few feet from the wall, I could hear it distinctly. I managed to catch uncertain, strange, undistinguishable words. They came as if pronounced in low, murmured whispers. The word for Lorad was repeated several times in a sympathetic and sorrowful voice. Help! I cried with all my might. Help! I listened. I waited in the darkness for an answer, a cry, a mere breath of sound, but nothing came. Some minutes passed. A flood of ideas exploded into my mind. I feared my weakened voice would never reach my companions. It's them, I repeated. What other men could be thirty leagues underground? I began to listen again. Passing my ear over the wall from one place to another, I found the point where the voices seemed to be heard best. The word Forlarad came again to me, then the rolling of thunder which had roused me from my lethargy. No, I said. No. It's not through such a solid mass that a voice can be heard. I'm surrounded by granite walls, and the loudest explosion could never be heard here. This noise is coming along the gallery. It must be due to some remarkable action of acoustic laws. I listened again, and this time, yes, this time I did distinctly hear my name, pronounced among, across the wide interval. It was my uncle's own voice. He was talking to the guide, and Fullerad is a Danish word. Then it all became clear. I made myself heard. I had to speak along this wall, which would conduct the sound of my voice just as wire conducts electricity. But there was no time to lose. If my companions moved but a few steps away, the acoustic phenomenon would cease. I therefore went close to the wall and pronounced these words as clearly as possible. Uncle Lidenbrock! I waited with the greatest anxiety. Sound doesn't travel very quickly. Even increased density of air has no effect on its rate of travel. It merely increases its intensity. Seconds, which seemed ages, passed away, and at last these words reached me. Axel! Axel, is that you? Pause. Yes, yes, I replied. My boy, where are you? Lost in the deepest darkness. Where's your lamp? It's gone out. And the stream? Disappeared. Be brave, Axel. Don't lose heart. Wait a second. I'm exhausted. I can't answer, but keep talking to me. Be brave, said my uncle again. 
Don't talk. Listen to me. We've looked for you up and down the gallery. Couldn't find you. I wept for you, my poor boy. At last, supposing you were still on Hans's brook, we fired our guns. Now at least we can hear each other, even if our hands cannot touch. But don't despair, Axel. To be able to hear each other is something. During this time, I had been thinking. A vague hope was returning to my heart. There was one thing I needed to know to begin with. I placed my lips close to the wall, saying, Uncle! My boy! Came to me after a few seconds. I need to know how far apart we are. That's easy. Have you got your chronometer? Yes. Well, get ready to use it. Say my name, noting exactly the second when you speak. I'll repeat it as soon as it reaches me, and you will note the exact moment when you are ready. Yes, and half the time between my call and your answer will indicate exactly the time my voice will have taken to reach you. Exactly, Uncle. Are you ready? Yes. Now pay attention, I'm going to call your name. I put my ear to the wall, and as soon as the name Axel came, I immediately replied, Axel, then waited. Forty seconds, said my uncle. Forty seconds between the two words, so the sound takes twenty seconds to travel between us. Now, at the rate of one thousand twenty feet per second, that's twenty thousand four hundred feet, or just under four miles, more or less. Four miles, I murmured. It'll soon be over, Axel. Do we need to go up or down? Down, and I'll tell you why. We've reached a vast chamber with a large number of galleries. Yours must lead into it, because it looks like all the clefts and fractures of the globe radiate out from this huge cavern. So, get up and start walking. Keep walking, drag yourself along if necessary. Slide down the steep parts, and at the end, gallery, you'll find us waiting for you. Now, my boy, get going. These words cheered me up. Goodbye, uncle, I cried. I'm setting off now. There will be no more voices heard once I've started, so goodbye. Goodbye, Axel. See you soon. These were the last words I heard. This wonderful underground conversation, carried on over the distance of four miles that separated us, ended with these words of hope. I thanked God from my heart, for it was he who had led me through those vast, lonely places to the point where, perhaps there alone and nowhere else, the voices of my companions could reach me. This acoustic effect is easily explained scientifically. It arose from the concave shape of the gallery and the conducting power of the rock. There are many examples of this transmission of sounds, which remain unheard in the intervening space. I remember that a similar phenomenon has been observed in many places, amongst others, on the internal surface of the Whispering Gallery on the Dome of St. Paul's in London, and especially in the middle of strange caver caverns in the quarries near Syracuse, the most wonderful of which is called Dionysus' Ear. As I remembered these things, I could see clearly that, since my uncle's voice had reached me, there could be no barrier between us. Following the direction from which the sound came, I would without a doubt arrive where he was, if my strength didn't fail me. So I got up, I dragged myself more than walked. The slope descended rapidly, and I slid down. Soon the speed of the descent increased frighteningly and threatened to become a fall. I no longer had the strength to stop myself. Suddenly, there was no ground under me. I felt myself spinning in the air, striking and rebounding from the rocky projections of a vertical gallery, virtually a well. My head hit a sharp rock, and I lost consciousness. This is a bit of a turning point. We've got chapter 29, The Sea, The Sea. When I came to, I was lying stretched out in semi-darkness, covered with thick coats and blankets. My uncle was watching over me, looking for the slightest signs of life. At my first sigh, he took hold of my hand. When I opened my eyes, he uttered a cry of joy. He's alive! He's alive! He shouted. Yes, I'm still alive, I answered weakly. My dear nephew, cried my uncle, hugging me to his breast. You're safe. I was deeply touched by the tenderness of his manner as he uttered these words, and still more with the care with which he watched over me but it took trials such as this for the professor to show his more tender emotions. At that moment, Hans appeared. He saw my hand in my uncle's, and I may safely say that there was an expression of pleasure on his face. God dag, he said. 
Good day, Hans. Good day. And now, Uncle, tell me where we are at this particular moment. Tomorrow, Axel, tomorrow. You're too weak today. I've bandaged your head with compresses, which mustn't be disturbed. Sleep now, and tomorrow I will tell you everything. But you tell me what time it is and what day. It's Sunday, the 9th of August, and it's 10 o'clock at night. You must ask me no more questions until the 10th. Truth to tell, I was very weak, and my eyes closed of their own accord. I was needing a good night's rest. So off I went to sleep, with the knowledge that I had been four long days alone in the heart of the earth. Next morning, when I awoke, I looked all around me. My bed, made up of all of our traveling rugs, was in a charming grotto that was decorated with magnificent, magnificent stalactites, and whose floor would consisted of a fine sand. It was half light. There was no torch and no lamp, but a certain mysterious light was coming from outside the grotto through a narrow opening, and I could also hear a vague, indistinct noise, something like the murmuring of waves breaking on a sh shiningly shore, and at times I thought I could hear wind whistling. I wondered whether, whether I was awake or dreaming, whether perhaps my brain, arranged by my fall, was being affected by imaginary noises. Yet neither my eyes nor my ears could be deceived to that extent. It's a ray of daylight, I thought, slipping in through this cleft in the rock. And that is indeed the murmuring of waves. That's the rustling noise of wind. Am I quite mistaken, or have we returned to the surface of the earth? Has my uncle given up the expedition, or has it come to a successful conclusion? I was asking myself these unanswerable questions when the professor came in. Good morning, Axel, he exclaimed, exclaimed cheerfully. I expect you're feeling better. Yes, I certainly am, said I, sitting up on my bed. You could hardly fail to be better, since you've had a peaceful sleep. Hans and I watched over you in turn, and we could see you were evidently recovering. Yes, I do feel a great deal better, and I'll prove that to you in a moment if you'll let me have my breakfast. You'll have something to eat, my boy. The fever has left you. Hans rubbed your wounds with some ointment or other that the Icelanders keep the secret of, and they have healed marvelously. He's a splendid fellow, that hunter of ours. Whilst he went on talking, my uncle prepared some food, which I devoured eagerly, notwithstanding his advice to the contrary. All the while, I was badgering him with questions which he was more than willing to answer. I then learned that I, my providential fall had brought me right to the foot of an almost perpendicular shaft, and as I landed in the midst of an accompanying torrent of stones, the smallest of which would have been enough to crush me, the conclusion was that part of the rock face had come down with me. This terrifying conveyance had thus carried me into the arms of my uncle, where I fell bruised, bleeding, and unconscious. It's quite incredible that you weren't killed a hundred times over. But for the love of God, let's stay together from now on, or we might never see each other again. Stay together. Is the journey not over, then? I opened a pair of astonished eyes, which immediately prompted the question. What's the matter, Axel? I have a question to ask you. You, you say that I'm safe and sound? No doubt you are. And all my limbs unbroken? Certainly. And my head? Your head, except for a few bruises, is all right. And it's on your shoulders, where it ought to be. Well, I am afraid my brain is affected. Your mind is affected? Yes, I fear so. Are we not back in the surface of the globe? No, certainly not. Then I must be mad, because I imagine I can see the light of day, and hear the wind blowing in the sea, breaking on the shore. Oh, is that all? Can you explain it to me? I can't explain the inexplicable. But you will soon see and understand that geology has not let, not yet, learnt all that it has yet to learn. Then let's go, I answered quickly. No, Axel, the open air might be bad for you. Open air? Yes, the wind is rather strong. You mustn't expose yourself. But I assure you, I'm perfectly well. A little patience, my boy. A remap relapse might get us into difficulty, and we've no time to lose, as the voyage may be a long one. The voyage? Yes. Rest today, and tomorrow we will set sail. Set sail? The words made me jump. What did it all mean? Was there a river, a lake, or a sea for us to cross? Did we have a ship at our disposal in some underground harbor? My curiosity was greatly aroused, and my uncle tried in vain to restrain me. 
when he saw that my impatience would do more harm than giving in to it, would, he relented. I quickly got dressed. As a precaution, I wrapped myself in a blanket and left the grotto. Chapter 30. A New Mare and Turnum At first, I could hardly see anything. My eyes, unaccustomed to the light, quickly closed. When I was able to reopen them, I stood more stupefied than surprised. The sea, I cried. Yes, my uncle replied. The Lidenbrock Sea. And I don't imagine any other explorer will ever dispute my claim to name it after myself as its first discoverer. A vast sheet of water, the start of a lake or an ocean, spread far away beyond what the eye could see. The deeply indent indented shoreline was lined with a stretch of fine, shining sand, softly lapped by the waves and strewn with small shells which had been inhabited by the earliest creatures of creation. The waves broke on the shore with the hollow echoing murmur peculiar to vast enclosed spaces. A light foam blew over the waves on the breath of a moderate breeze, and some of the spray fell on my face. On the other edge of this light sloping shore, about a hundred fathoms from the waves, was a huge wall of vast cliffs rising majestically to a great height. Some of these, dividing the beach with their sharp spurs, formed capes and promontories, worn away by the sleep ceaseless action of the surf. Farther on, the eye could discern their massive outline, sharply defined against the distant, hazy horizon. It certainly was a real ocean, with the irregularity of the shorelines on Earth, but deserted and horribly wild in appearance. If my eyes were ever able to range far over this great sea, it was because a peculiar light made every detail of it clearly visible. It wasn't the light of the sun with its dazzling shafts of brightness and the splendor of its rays, nor was it the pale and uncertain shimmer of moonbeams, the dim reflection of a nobler body of light. No, the illuminating power of this light, its crumbling diffuseness, its bright, clear whiteness and its low temperature, showed that it must be of electrical origin. It was like an aurora borealis, a continuous cosmic phenomenon filling a cavern large enough to contain an ocean. The vault that spanned the space above, the sky, if it could be called, seemed to be made up of vast plains of cloud, shifting in variable vapors, which at certain times condensed and fell in torrents of rain. I would have thought that under no so great an atmosphere of pressure, there could be no evaporation. And yet, by a law of physics unknown to me, there were broad tracts of vapor suspended in the air. But then, one could say it was a fine day. The play of the electric light produced peculiar effects on the upper strata of cloud. Deep shadows formed on their lower curves, and often between two separated strata of cloud, there glided down a ray of indescribable brightness. But it wasn't solar light, and there was no heat. The general effect was sad, supremely melancholy. Instead of the shining firmament spangled with innumerable stars shining singly or in clusters, I could feel above the clouds vast granite arches which seemed to crush me with their weight. And all this space, great as it was, would not have been enough for the orbit of the humblest of satellites. Then I remembered the theory of an English captain who likened the earth to a vast hollow sphere in the interior of which the air became luminous because of the vast pressure of it, while within it two heavenly bodies, Pluto and Prosperina, followed their mysterious orbits. Had he been right? We were in reality enclosed inside a vast cavern. Its width could not be estimated, since the shore continued to widen out as far as the eye could see. Nor could its length, for the dim horizon limited one's view. As for its height, it must have been several leagues high. Where this vault rested on its granite base, no eye could tell, but there was a cloud hanging far above, the height of which we estimated at 12,000 feet, a greater height than that of any terrestrial vapor, and no doubt due to the great density of the air. The word cavern does not convey any idea of this immense space. Words of human language are inadequate to describe the discoveries of one who ventures into deep abysses of the earth. I couldn't decide what geological theory would account for the existence of such a cavern. Had the cooling of the globe produced it? 
I knew of famous caverns from the descriptions of travelers, but had never heard of any such dimensions as this. Even if the grotto of Gachura in Colombia, visited by Humboldt, did not fully divulge the secrets of its depth to him, he did investigate it to a depth of 250, or two, uh, 200, 2,500 feet, and it probably didn't extend much farther than that. The immense Mammoth Cave in Kentucky is of gigantic proportions, since its vaulted roofs rises 500 feet above an unfathomable lake, and travelers have explored its ramifications for ten leagues. But what were these holes compared to that one I was admiring, with its sky of luminous vapors, its bursts of electric light, and a vast sea filling its bed? My imagination was powerless before such immensity. I gazed at these wonders in silence. I couldn't find the words to express my feelings. I felt as if I was on some distant planet, such as Uranus or Neptune, and in the presence of phenomena of which my terrestrial experience gave me no knowledge. For such novel sensations, new words were wanting, and my imagination failed to supply them. I gazed, I thought, I admired, with a stupefaction tinged with fear. The unforeseen nature of this spectacle brought back the color to my cheeks. I was receiving a new course of treatment with the help of astonishment, and my convalescence was prom prom promoted by this novel system of therapeutics. And besides, the dense and breezy air invigorated me, supplying more option to my lungs. It will be easily conceived that after 47 days imprisonment in a narrow gallery, it was the height of physical enjoyment to breathe moist air impregnated with salty particles. I was delighted to leave my dark grotto. My uncle, already familiar with these wonders, had ceased to feel surprised. Do you feel strong enough to take a little walk now? He asked. Yes, certainly, and nothing would be more delightful. Well, I'll take my arm, Axel, and let's follow the windings of the shore. I eagerly accepted, and we began to follow the coast along this new sea. On the left, huge pyramids of rock piled one upon another, created a prodigious titanic effect. Down their sides flowed countless waterfalls, which wended their way in clear, gurgling streams. A few, few light vapors, leaping from rock to rock, indicated where there were hot springs, and streams flowed gently down to the common basin, gliding down the gentle slopes with a softer murmur. Amongst these streams, I recognized our faithful traveling companion, Hans's brook, coming to quietly add its little volume to the mighty sea, just as if it had done nothing else since the beginning of the world. We won't see it again, I said with a sigh. That one or another one, replied the professor. What does it matter? I thought him rather ungrateful. But at the moment, my attention was drawn to an unexpected sight. Five hundred yards away, along a high promontory, appeared a tall, tuft, dense, forest. It was composed of trees of moderate height, umbrella-like in form, with sharp geometrical outlines. The currents of wind seemed to have had no effect on their shape, and in the midst of the windy blasts they stood unmoved and firm, just like a clump of petrified cedars. I moved toward them. I couldn't give any name to these singular creations. Were they among the 200,000 known plant species, or did they claim a place of their own in lakeland flora? No. When we arrived up under their shade, my surprise turned to wonder. There before me stood products of earth, but of gigantic proportions. My uncle immediately said what they were. It's just a forest of mushrooms, he said. And he was right. Imagine the large development attained by these plants, which prefer a warm, moist climate. I knew that the Lacombaron giganteum attains, according to Bulliard, a circumference of eight or nine feet, but here there were pale mushrooms thirty to forty feet high and crowned by a cap of equal diameter. They stood there in their thousands. No light could penetrate their huge cones, and complete darkness reigned beneath those giants. They formed settlements of domes in close array like the round, thatched roofs of a central African city. I wanted to walk beneath them, through a chill, uh, though a chill fell on me as soon as I came under those cellular vaults. For half an hour we wandered from side to side in the damp shade, and it was a comfortable and pleasant change to arrive once more on the seashore. 
But the vegetation, uh, subterranean vegetation, was not confined to these fungi. Rather, on those rose groups of tall trees of colorless foliage, easy to recognize. On earth, there were lowly shrubs, but here they attained gigantic sites, like a podia a hundred feet high, huge sigillaria found in our coal mines, tree ferns as tall as our fir trees of northern latitudes, lepidenterons with cylindrical forked stems ending in large, long leaves and bristling with rough hairs. Wonderful, magnificent, splendid, cried my uncle. Here is the entire flora of the second period of the world, the transition period. Here, humble garden plants, as they are with us now, were tall trees in early ages. Look, Axel, and wonder at it all. Never had a botanist such a feast as this. You're right, uncle. Providence seems to have preserved in this immense conservatory the antediluvian plants which the wisdom of scientists has so sagaciously put together again. It is a conservatory, Axel, but is it not also a menagerie? Surely not a menagerie. Yes, there's no doubt about it. Look at that dust under your feet. See the bones scattered to the ground. So there are, I explained, the bones of extinct animals. I rushed to look at these remains, formed of an indestructible mineral substance, calcium phosphate, and without hesitation, I identified these monstrous bones which lay scattered about like decayed tree trunks. Here's the lower jaw of a mastodon, I said. These are the molar teeth of the dinotherium. This femur must have belonged to the largest of those animals, the megatherium. It certainly is a menagerie, because these remains were not brought here, brought here by a flood. The animals they belonged to roamed on these shores of the subterranean sea, under the shade of these arborescent plants. There are entire, there are entire skeletons here. And yet, I can't understand how these quadrupeds appear in a granite cavern. Why? Because animal life existed on Earth only in the secondary period, when a sediment of soil had been deposited by, by the rivers, and taken the place of the incandescent rocks of the primitive period. Well, Axel, there's a very simple answer to your objection, which is that this soil is alluvial. What? At such a depth below the surface of the Earth? Without a doubt, and there's a geological explanation for that. At a certain period, the earth consisted of only an elastic crust or bark, alternately uh, acted on by forces from above or below, according to the laws of attraction and gravitation. Probably there were subsid uh, subsidences of the outer crust when some of the sub sedimentary deposit was carried down through sudden openings. That may be so, I replied. But if there have been creatures now extinct in these underground regions, is there any reason why some of those monsters might not still be roaming through these gloomy forests, or hidden behind the steep crags? And as this unpleasant notion gripped me, I anxiously surveyed the open spaces before me, but no living creature appeared on the barren shore. I felt rather tired, and went to sit down at the point of a promontory, at the foot of which the waves were beating themselves into spray. From there, my eye could scan every part of this bay created by an indentation in the coastline. The end of the bay formed a little harbor between the pyramidal cliffs, where the still waters slept, sheltered from the boisterous winds. A brig and two or three schooners might safely have moored within it. I almost fancied I would presently see some ship set sail out under full sail and take to the open sea in the southern breeze. But this illusion lasted a very short time. We were the only living creatures in the subterranean world. When the wind dropped, a deeper silence than that of the deserts fell on the arid, naked rocks and weighed heavily on the surface of the ocean. I tried to see through the distant haze and to tear apart the mysterious curtain that hung across the horizon. Anxious questions came to my lips. Where did that sea end? Where did it lead to? Would we ever know anything about its far shores? My uncle had absolutely no doubt about it. For my part, I both wanted and feared to know. After spending an hour contemplating this marvelous spectacle, we returned to the shore to go back to the grotto, and I fell asleep in the midst of the strangest thoughts. All right, so I'm sure you will agree this is a 
for most of the way through this book, and it certainly is picking up now. It's uh, I'm happy to say that it's only going to be getting more and more exciting from here on out. Uh, so next is chapter 31, Preparations for a Voyage of Discovery, uh, and hopefully I'll see you soon. All right, thank you very much for joining me. Goodbye.